Hello and welcome back. Today we are here with the extremely courageous John Joseph. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. You are the lead singer of the punk bands Cro-Mag and Blood Clot. You are the author of several books, including Hardcore Kitchen, The PMA Effect, and The Evolution of uh, Cro-Magnon. And That's this not lovely that book. book. We, can't, that we can't say the title, but there it is. <laughs> Unfew. Unfew. Unfew yourself. <laughs> Damn yourself. you. <laughs> You are a whole food, plant-based advocate and 12-time Ironman triathlete. You are also the survivor of child abuse, drug addiction, and prison. You have an epic life journey and I would love to get into it. What led you to being placed in foster care and how old were you? I gotta go back to the 60s because uh, my father was a professional boxer, uh, fought under training on the Customato at Gramercy Gym on in Union Square and uh, just, you know, had a great amateur career, undefeated, and then started turn pro and, you know, he started drinking and, and became very violent and um, started beating down, uh, you know, my mother after m my brother was born. And uh, he actually broke in, she left him and uh, he, came into her house and raped her, and I was conceived out of that rape. But they were still married. Yeah, they were still married, so the police didn't do anything. And he did the same thing again, and then my younger brother was born. So there she was with three kids, uh, and he would just break in and uh, you know force his way in, beat her down, take any money she had to feed us, um, just very brutal. And uh, she spun into depression and started, you know, taking pills and all this stuff. And uh, the landlady that the house we were in called child services. And like, we, we had been like filthy. When they showed up, we were outside in our underwear and like the house was filthy. And they just removed us and placed us into Angel Guardian Home First, which was like an orphanage. And I wrote about that in the book because I remember like the red lights in the dorm and just like, like hell. It was like all these kids crying and, and then they placed us in like a temporary foster home. And then another one, the Sheridans in Brooklyn, and they were very nice to us. But I think it was the father got cancer, so they gave us up and split us up and then me and my younger brother ended up in this foster home in, in uh, Long Island just with terrible people doing horrible things to us. And uh, then my other brother ended up, E ended up, um, ended up with us as well. And then we were there for uh, five years, like uh, this was 1970, and we got removed in 75 from like, we never said anything about what they were doing to us because um, he threatened us, you know? He said he was gonna put me in a mental institution. Can you tell the story of how he put your face up to Yeah, you? he, um, so when we first got there, it was summertime, so they just had us working as like indentured, slaves cleaning their house and just starving us. Like I would literally ha steal the dog's food to eat. And she made us like Oreo spit sandwiches. Like she didn't like the cream filling. So, she, you know, she would scrape it off and spit it in a bowl and wipe it on green molded bread. And meanwhile, they were getting all this money to take care of us. And he was very violent with us. Uh, they made all the kids bathe in the same water. And I was like the last one the first time and I pulled the thing, the plug out to change the water and he just came in and, you know, he used to wear these big rings and just like backhanded me into the wall and, you know, always grabbed us by the hair, smack, like hit us, Garibaldi, like all the I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse, but you know, all this stuff, it was just mental torture constantly, physical abuse, 
the older kids there were sexually abusing us, threatening us. So the thing was, when I went to school, I was like, finally, I'm gonna get to tell somebody. And I showed the nurse the bruises and she called him down. And he was like, worked on this like wallpaper truck paint route. He was a driver. So he comes in in his uniform and he, she was like, oh, you know, they made, he made some serious allegations and showed the bruises. And he goes, oh, they, they got that playing tackle football. You know, you never saw any of the other kids complain, never said anything, because they were terrified. And um, they bought it, and he took me, mm -hmm. and I didn't know where we were going. We just were driving, and he took me to Pilgrim State Mental Hospital, pulls up in the brand new Cadillac that we had paid for, and... Um, grabs me by my head, drags me out of the car. I'm like screaming, you know, and he just smashes my face against the fence and all the mental patients were like, you know, coming over there, like grabbing my eye and my nose. And then he's like, if you ever say anything again, I'm gonna put you in here. Nobody's ever gonna know where you are. You're never gonna see your brothers again. So then I never said anything and we just kept a diary of everything they did to us, everything they fed us, like just all of it. You wrote it all down. My brother did. I, I told the one story, like he would come and we slept in the garage, never allowed in the house. The entire time we were there, we never went into the refrigerator one single time. Like they gave us rotten, rancid cold cuts how like long were you living with these people? Five years. And, and, and um, it was like, he would wake us up even in the middle of winter and we, we'd have no coats or nothing. And he, we'd have to walk a mile to this bakery to, to get him his hard rolls and all the stuff that he wanted and get a pack of, he smoked Kent's. He's like, get, a, get me a carton of cigarettes. And we would go into the bakery and the man would always put out this aluminum tray with samples. And we would, you know, and they wanted sliced rye bread, this, that, crellas, mm. jelly donuts. And the guy started realizing what was happening. Like, and then we would eat all the samples that he had there and he would come back out and we'd have stuff all over our face and you're only supposed to take one. We would just like, we were starving. Yeah. When you're starving, you, you just course. do like whatever it takes to eat. Nobody knows when people say, oh, I'm starving. Don't ever say you're starving unless you're starving. Mm. You don't know what starving is. Yeah. And we were being starved. And he started realizing that. And then when we would come in, he's like, oh, I made too many of these jelly donuts. You think you guys, you know, and cream donuts and whatever. But- um, Did you ever go back to these, th this home? You know, um, when my book, Evolution of a Cro-Magnon came out, uh, I started doing a lot of readings and talks. So they had me do a reading at a bookstore, record shop, a couple towns away. And the person that drove me there was uh, my friend, Stephanie Swain. She worked for Simon & Schuster. So I, did, I put it out independently, but she helped me with everything, like Mark, like, you know, the press and whatever. So she drove me out. She rented a minivan and drove me out there. And we, she's like, you sure you want to do this? And I was sitting there. I'm in the passenger seat and the house was over there. And I was like, you know, I was like, I have to do this. And uh, so, you know, I just for effect, like if case they were there and, and the car was in the driveway, I was like, somebody's in there. I wore like a, a wife beater and like Terminator shades. And I was like, you know, pretty jacked. Yeah, all your and tats. Yeah, so I got out and this old Italian man was like watering his lawn over there. And I go, I go, uh, hey, how, how long you lived in this neighborhood? And he was like, oh, 60 years, I came up from Italy. And then I'm looking at him and I'm like, I remembered him because like 
he lived across the street from them. They were both Italian and they would have dinners and we would have to be in this screened in shed and they would have people coming over eating like all this tremendous food and we would hear them laughing and jovial and just sitting out in the cold, dark patio, screened in patio, starving, listening to them eat. Why did these people- Because they're psych, they have psychological problems. These are, these are, these are sick people. They were sick. What made them be like, mm, I think we should um, become foster For the parents. money. Yeah. For the money. Yeah. They got $300 a month for each of us in, yeah. in 1970 and they had six kids. 300 and then money for clothing, food, all this other stuff. They didn't do it for love. Yeah. They, you know, it was, it was, we want the money. And they took all that money and never gave us anything. We had to climb into Salvation Army poor boxes and steal clothes that were hanging off of us. And then you show up at school and somebody's like, my brother threw that shirt away. And like, we were the ridiculed people of the neighborhood. We were the freaks. And, um, you know, so when I got out, I recognized, like after yeah. we talked, I remembered and I go, who lives in that house over there? Is that still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, the father died of cancer. And I knew that because that message had gotten to us. He always had this hacking cough and he died of lung cancer. So I knew that that happened. But then and then I was like, I looked at him and I go, you know, I was one of the foster kids in there that got that house shut down. And he looked at me and he just dropped the garden hose and ran into his garage, into his house. Cause they knew at some point we were coming back. And then I was like, yo, they're still there. And Stephanie said to me, do you want me to come with you? And I go, nah, I'm gonna, I gotta do this by myself. So I went up to the door and I'm like, boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, first I rang the bell, nobody answered it. Then I was like, open up the screen door. I'm like, bam, bam, bam. And then I hear like footsteps and the door pulls open. And she's like, what the hell? Who the hell are you? What are you banging on my door like that? And the first thing I did was look because she had this big black bean mole that was had hair in it and no you know so when she scraped the oreo fillings it, oh. and like these yellow teeth oh. i was just like yeah it was something out of a horror movie and i knew it was her and the second thing i did was look inside because they made us always sweep those carpets and i was like do they still have the carpets and they had parquet floors but then I made her say her name. I go, are you such and such? Is that you? And she wouldn't, she goes, why? Yeah, why? And I go, I was one of the foster kids in there. And she goes, take your glasses off. And I did, and she goes, she's like falls back clutching her chest, like you're Marie's son, like that. And then her daughter came and was like, oh my God, we were just talking about you and wondering, uh, come inside. And I was like, and she opened the door and I was like, what the hell makes you think I have any good memories of what you people did to us? And that's when they were like, this dude didn't come out here to smoke him peace pipe. He's out here for like something else. And then she tried, she nervously changed the subject because Stephanie was looking like right there. She goes, who's that in the minivan? Is that, is that your wife? And I go, nah, that's, she's helping me with my book uh, that just came out. And she goes, oh, you wrote a book? You're gonna be famous? And I go, no, but you are. And I just turned and walked away and I was like, Stephanie, what are they doing? I go under my breath and she's yeah. like, their jaws are just hanging. <laughs> and I got uh. in that van and I went to Looney Tunes, which was the book record store. And I did one of the best readings I ever did in my life. And, and, and I was just so fired up, but I had to confront them. And I told them, you didn't win. You tried to win. You tried to, you know, you tried to destroy us and make us feel like we didn't matter and we weren't, 
You know, we weren't worth anything. Like your dog, Smokey, was more, you cared more about a dog than you did about the kids in this home. People need to know that there is hope, that there is healing, that God loves you so much, and that there is a plan and a purpose for every single human being's life, and everybody should be loved and treasured, and there's always an opportunity for that. And there's always hope and healing, and you are a beacon for that. You are a beacon to say, no matter what has happened to you, you can always come out of it, you can always use it, and you give people permission to say, oh wow, he went through similar, so that means I'm gonna be okay. Right. You give people hope through your story, and well, so, thank um, you. Using my example, there was a lot of embarrassment. You're so strong. You're so strong. Yeah, I know. It's okay. You can cry. It's fine. I cry all the time. Sometimes it just hits. Yeah, I know. I feel it too sometimes when I talk about my past. Yeah. I know. I get it. But the book, it gave me the power to confront all this stuff. What would you want to say to Child Protective Services today on how to improve the conditions and experiences children are subjected to in the system? Well, the one thing I have to say is there's always signs. There's always signs that something is not what it's supposed to be, and you have to follow up on that. Like for instance, with us, I still remember Bob Hayes, our social worker, if you're out there, I forgive you, whatever. Mm. But he, he never would just pop up and visit. He would always be like, oh, I'm coming uh, Thursday the 15th in three months. And then they would just interrogate us and threaten us and put the fear of God into us if we said anything. and. You know, he would never, like when he read our diary that we kept, he broke down crying. Like what was going on and he had no idea. Was it too late by that time? Yeah, well, he took, they took us out of the home. We gave him the diary after we, we, we gave him the diary. We met him at the school and my brother gave him the diary. And then he was like, and he kept us in the damn house after that for another week before we could be moved out of there. And all of a sudden they're like, you're gonna tell them you lied. Uh, they, they, they took us to the International House of Pancakes every day. They got us anything we wanted. We got pool passes, like clothes, trying to con us that when Mr. Hayes came to get us, we would say, we lied. We made it all up. Like what he said when I went to the nurses, this little guy always makes up stories but because he wants his mother to take him back, but she's, she's messed up. She's, she's a pill popper and all this other stuff. And, and we knew we wanted out. We knew it was a wrap, so we made him buy us everything. If we saw something, we're like, I want that. I want that. We made him just keep buying us stuff. And, and, um, taking us out. And then when Mr. Hayes came, they said to him, the father goes, Bob, the John, Frank, and Eugene have something they want to tell you. And they thought we were going to say we made it up. And I said, every single thing we told you and we wrote in that diary is the truth. And then their jaws just dropped. And my brother, my younger brother said, you always called us the crazy ones. You're the crazy people. And we walked out of that house and that was it. That must have felt really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those caseworkers have such an important job to do what's yeah. right now yeah. before it gets worse and then society gets worse. Well, that's like, what's happening. That's what society's spinning out of control because it has, the situation's gotten worse. I have to say that. Back then, 
it wasn't as rampant as it is now. Now you're having people not qualified to be parents, having kids and the addiction and the depression and people acting out and they take it out on their kids. I'm, I, I've seen it got, since I was a kid and I'm, I'm turning 59 now, since I was that seven year old kid, you know, 52 years ago in society, the family structure's being destroyed. It's just, and then women, you know, some women aren't strong enough to stand on their own and, and, and they get in with these boyfriends. It's like my mom, she kept promising us we would just steal and, 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 and we, instead of eating and taking that money to eat, we would buy, we saved up. And I, I, it's in the evolution of a coat magnon. We saved up and we bought her this Christ head necklace that said, we love you, mom. And we thought this is, this is going to be the Christmas we go home. But it never happened because the boyfriend didn't want us around because we were interfering with his relationship with her, whatever, you know, I have a term for that when they're not having sex because you're around, I won't say it. And she just kept promising us and letting us down and let us in, letting us down. And I just gave up finally. And then my brother did that to his kids. His kids would have their bags packed waiting for him and he'd be off in a drug spot and never show up and leave those kids there. And that's why I said you repeated that cycle of what our father did to us. And the funny thing is, you talk about forgiveness at the end of the evolution of a Cro-Magnon, I said, this is the stuff that helped me heal, you know, writing this book and all this other work I've done on myself mm -hmm. and forgiving my mother and hearing her story and seeing my brother. But my mother's husband later in life was a gambler, a former alcoholic, and he gambled away the house and without her knowing it. So when they got divorced, he had taken liens on the house. She was homeless. She just was terrified to be alone. She was always terrified to be by herself. And I, at the time, was successful in the music. I said, I said, Ma, I'm gonna get you an apartment. I'm gonna get you furniture. I got her this apartment. I paid for everything, tens and thousands of dollars new TV, got her the apartment, gave her money, got her furniture, she lost everything. And I put her in this place and she calls me up one day. This is how me and her healed out between us. And I wrote about it in my book. She calls me up and she goes, I have something to tell you. I don't, I said, what? She's like, I don't want you to be mad. I said, ma, what? She goes, I let Carl move in with me. And that was the boyfriend that didn't want us around, that we had to suffer. When he would pick us up to take us for visits, he'd be like, I'm gonna make sure you sons of bitches are never coming back here again. And like, I'm a, I, I just was like, I was like, how the hell could you do that to me? Of all people, that guy. I was furious. And then we, I said so many mean things to her and she said, stop, stop. And we had, she told me her story of being raped and everything else on the phone. And that's and we, what she told you. And we just broke down crying in silence, sobbing. And I'm telling you, it was like five minutes holding the receiver. Wow. And that was it, man. We've been tight ever since. What a blessing. And not only that, he moved in because he had cancer. He ditched his wife, left her to die with emphysema and cancer. And then he got cancer and didn't tell my mother. And she ended up having to keep him there until he went to his deathbed. And he showed up on my porch. And this guy was huge. And he weighed about 130 pounds at this point, dying and said, I'm sorry for everything. Wow. And I, and I forgave him. Mm. And I went to his deathbed, I put holy water from India and mm. mantras and I said, 
Have a great journey. But I had to forgive that dude. Yeah. You were incarcerated twice. What put you in prison and what was that whole experience like for you? Um, well, I started going on the streets in 76 and I racked up, I sold to undercovers. So that was my first charge. St. John's took me back, told me, oh, if you get in trouble again, we're sending you to Spofford. You don't want to go to Spofford. South Bronx, maximum security, 21 and under. I split, I went back out onto the streets and I was hanging out with very dangerous people. And uh, we broke through a supermarket roof to get into the safe. Cops caught us. That was the second charge. What did you, how did you break into the roof? Did you well, we on? cut through the skyline, the skylight, and we saw- What are you, the, special forces? No, well, that's what, <laughs> I, I'm a kid, so the guy was lowering me down on a rope tied what? around my waist. So we, we cut the bars to get through the skylight. He's gonna lower me down and he's like, such and such gave me the combination. Well, guess what? We found out later, he slept, the guy I'm doing this with, messed with that guy's girlfriend and set us up. <gasps> so she yeah. didn't have the code. Well, I don't know if it was the code or not. I never made it down inside. We cut the bars, the bars dropped to the floor and he was Mission about to lower me down. <laughs> like he um. tied it off to something else and was gonna like, repel me down and then all these floodlights came on they're like jerk off get down <laughs> surrounded the okay corral and then they're like that's two strikes i had to beg st john's not to send me to spofford and i split again right after that because they said if you have anything happen while you're here again, you're going to Spofford, that's it. And you're gonna await your cases. So I had two pending cases and then I ended up at the dome selling angel dust. And I sold for this dude. And uh, this guy, he looked like John Travolta on steroids. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Disco Mike, they called him, right? or disco or whatever he and it was a rocker place so i started selling dust at the dome with him for him mm. and um crazy stuff happened man somebody came in shooting one day i caught a bullet in the leg and where uh in the back in my calf over here you can oh it was a 22 goodness. right in the see this in yes. the face of vishnu yeah uh in the lakshmi so I couldn't go to the hospital because I had warrants. And even like a few months earlier than that, I got beat up by these Italians in Spaghetti Park with baseball bats. And they like tried to murder me, but I got away, but I was messed up. And I had just robbed my mother's house. With and all the stuff that you bought her? Or that was after? Yeah, no, I uh, I smashed everything. I bought her paintings. I smashed everything that we got her. And, uh, and so I, call, I had to call up the, from the hospital and be like, I need you to come down to Elmhurst General. I'm really bad. They beat me up with bats. And she says, go to hell. Oh, <laughs> Hangs up the phone. No. So I knew I couldn't go back to the hospital with a bullet. So this guy- You said it was a 22? 22, yeah. Uh, Thank God it was a yeah. tiny bullet because it would've went through your leg. Yeah, but it was like, a, I was running away, so he caught me just in the back oh, of the leg. Okay. Like I was, a, I didn't even stop running, but I had to, so this guy, Disco was like, oh, and he had this little protege, right? This little Disco kid that was like 16. And I was like, there's something, there's something up here. Something just didn't seem kosher. Yeah. And um, he goes, let's go back to my house. I'll pull out, you know, the bullet. It's right there. Oh my goodness. So we get in his car and go to his house and, uh, oh, doing cocaine. He's like, a, you know, I guess a, a cuisine, you know, a, a, what we call the guido. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, everything, you, you know, glass mirrors, Coca-Cola yeah. mirror, you know. Yeah. The whole nine yards, Very big ornate. chains, the <laughs> yeah. slick back hair, gazelles. <laughs> you know, it's like, and um, oy, oy, oy. he put drugs in our drink. What? 
when I woke up, I had a bandage on my leg, but I woke up to him lifting me up and carrying me off to his bedroom. And I just started fighting him off. I'm like, yo, what are you doing? Get off me. And he had this look that I never seen before. Like, and he dropped me and he stood over me and I passed out again. What was he doing with you? And then I woke up to screaming and I walked to the back room and he was raping that kid. And I picked up the baseball bat and I started freaking smashing him with it. And... How old were you? I was still 15. I turned 16 in Spofford. Ay, yay, yay. But I started, I was a, I just a psychopath at that point. And, and when I opened that door and I saw that, I just, I just something just snapped. It was, and, it was a male would, raping a male. It was him raping that kid that, that was at the house with us. And this guy's 240 pound weightlifter raping like this skinny little 15, 16 year old disco kid. So I beat him with this bat till he went unconscious. And I went out to the living room. I grabbed all the bags of dust. I grabbed mm -hmm. the pipe. I took some money. Mm -mm -mm. And I walked out and I went back to Forest Park and I just started smoking all the dust. And the park was very hot because of what had happened. And the cops just rolled up and that was, they had surveillance of me selling. And I got to meet the cop who was in charge of the Angel Dust Task Force. This guy, John Wild Man Wild, because I wrote a pilot about the whole thing, and Patty Jenkins helped me write it, who did Monster. Mm -hmm. And I and Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman, yes. She is a very good friend of mine. I just saw her and her husband, Sam, the last time I was out here. Nice. She's so humble and so beautiful and always mm -hmm. pays it forward and helps me mm -hmm. with my writing. And, and mm -hmm. she was like, what's missing from this is the police aspect, that subtext. That became the central plot. And... Howie Tannenbaum, who signed, who uh, got Vince Gilligan, uh, who did Breaking Bad, flipped out on it and had me come out and meet him and all. Yeah, so all this stuff. But the point is that was, they took me to Kew Garden Central Booking and they said, if you give us the name of who's manufacturing this stuff, we'll just put you in Samaritan House uh, for a year upstate. You'll go to Ellenville or wherever. Were you tried as an adult at this point? No, or no? I was still okay. a juvenile. Okay. And I know what the law and the code of the streets is. You know, Beretta, the song, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. <laughs> so I'm like, you don't snitch. That's yeah. it. You don't snitch. Yeah. You never snitch. Hmm. I said, I don't know. They just dropped it off to me. Then they played the good cop, bad cop crap. What's gonna happen to me if I go to Spofford? Boom, sent me to Spofford. And it was, you know, even going in there in dock when you first get there and they're stripping you down. Biggest African-American dude comes, he's like, you're gonna be my Maytag. Like, you know, I'm gonna be his little bitch and do whatever he says and clean his sneakers or whatever else he thought you know, his underwear, like a Maytag is like a personal servant. And I was like, nah. Do people actually do that stuff? Yeah, are you kidding me? That's the law, you know, that you, you you get punked out in prison. That's what, they don't call it Maytag no more. But any old school people out there, you know what I'm talking about. And I said to him, nah, you're gonna be my Maytag. And he's like three times my size. And everybody started laughing. And I said to the Puerto Rican cat next to me, I was like, Yo, what the F is a Maytag? He's like, you just told that big brother that he's going to have to clean your, <laughs> you know, oh, and, no. and your drawers and your sneak. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, all right. Oh. And then we both went to the same unit, B3. Ay, yay, ay. And it didn't take the next night sitting in the TV lounge. I'm in the back row and we're watching like, like I don't know, some science fiction thing. Now keep in mind, Roots had just been on TV and I'm the only white dude in the whole joint. Think about that pressure, right? And 
everybody just starts laughing. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, and then I feel something on my neck and I turn around and he had his Johnson out, humping the back of my head. And I just picked up the chair I was in and just smashed it over his head and kept smashing him and kept smashing him. And then I went to his boy over there and I and I still have the scar. I lost my knuckle. And oh, um, oh yeah. I lost my whole knuckle. I bashed him like five times in the face and knocked him out. And then they put me in like restraints in a padded room. But then, you know, they don't give you anything to better yourself, but that's what they said at the end. What's your program? What are you doing to better yourself while you're in here? That's when I started like working out and I started writing stories that got noticed. What made you want to join the Navy and how long did you serve? So when I got out, that's the whole thing what we talked about with Paul DeGelder in, in, in 30 to Life was that yes, that's they don't give these too. people an opportunity to change their life. They don't give them a skill set. They just release these people after being locked up in cages. And, you know, it's so when I got out, I didn't have nothing. I went right back to selling drugs and I got popped. So then at the time, uh, my mother was dating a Navy recruiter or whatever, was friends with him. I don't know what their deal was. Yeah. Um, but he goes, you know, I could get you in the military. So it was basically I was going to end up going back to lock up or go in the Navy. And as my brother's book is called, the title, The State Didn't Raise No Fool, my brother Eve is writing his memoir now. Nice. Easy. When he came into the foster home, he took back some control for us. Mm -hmm. We found out where the money was. He told, we were taking the money that they were getting, little bits and pieces. He showed us how to scam and hustle. Now you gotta remember, we're eight years old. Panhandling outside of churches and doing all this stuff to be able to eat, you know, go to friendlies and have a meal and mm -hmm. like, uh, friendly. So yeah, we went to friend. I mean, I ate abominable food, but I was starving, so whatever, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't eat that now. Me and my brother went in on the buddy program, eat. So we were going to the same boot camp, except that he qualified because he's so smart for the nuclear engineer program. I had nothing because the ASVABs, I, I just barely passed them to get in the entrance uh, exam. So my brother E, he goes, yo, I know where they sell dust two blocks away from here. So we went and bought five bags of angel dust. Me and him smoked it. I got on the plane to go to boot camp to Great Lakes in the middle of the night, high on angel dust. Got off the bus. I was like, what the hell did I sign up for? Yeah. Passed out. <laughs> and then that's the, you know, my head cleared. I became the physical training petty officer of, of Company 003. In other words, like everybody had to do push ups to my account. If they messed up, they had to lift up their bunks, run to my account. They made me, they called it mashing everybody. So, okay. and then the guy told me about, oh, this frogman thing and go take this entrance exam to get in which was swimming. And then you got to run inside the pool, push ups, pull ups. I, I aced that and then hmm. they start putting you in this preconditioning thing. And because it was 50 below zero, you did it all in a hanger in the big, like a big hanger inside. And, you know, I rolled my knee or whatever. And then, so that got put on hold and then they put me out to the fleet and, uh, I continued my nefarious ways. I, 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 somebody on my ship was smuggling and I got involved with that. So I was smuggling quaaludes and uh, <laughs> weed from Jamaica and I had a drug business in Norfolk. And um, I got set up and I was at the King's Head Inn seeing like a punk band and I sold to undercover cops and they got me. And While you were in the Navy. Yeah, but and it was And you went civilian. into the Navy to not go back to prison, right? Yeah, so, so, so if it would have been they caught me on the base, it would have been automatic Leavenworth. But I, I had the lawyer up and then we were waiting for the case. So they gave me my ID in Puerto Rico. I started running around with all these crazy military divers and all these crazy people taking 
uh, acid and running around in the jungle, fighting in the bars down there with the Marines. Oh my God. And then like they sent me back to Norfolk and still didn't, they cut, they gave me my ID and was paying me. And then one day the guy goes, after like a month and a half, he goes, uh, McGowan, uh, we just got like a message, like a wire or whatever, and uh, your ship's coming in tomorrow. Wink, wink. What did that mean? It, it meant like he was warning me that they gave him, the, the subtext was they told us to hold you here, like that they're coming to arrest you. Okay. So I went, I got all my stuff together, and then the next morning as I was rolling out the gate on the bus, the two master at arms were crossing at the crosswalk and I'm sitting at the light and all they had to do was look to the left and I wouldn't be here talking to you right now because the bus, it was a civilian bus that came down Hampton Boulevard, went into the main Naval station, went all the way to the end, turned around and then went back out the gate. So I was on that bus and they were crossing over to go to Nimitz Hall to get me. And I just said like this, and they just walked in front of the bus and the bus pulled out the gate and I went AWOL for 15 years. 15 years you were AWOL? Assumed another person's identity, like just crazy. John, wait, your Traveled. life needs to be a movie. I know, you can't, like when the Village Voice in New York <laughs> got my book, they thought I made everything up. They, they was like, there's no way you did all this. What happened after 15 years? Did you? My bass player turned me in. Harley Flanagan <laughs> robbed the band. Oh, this was the cro -Mags Yeah, cro -Mags, and then he robbed the band and did all this crazy stuff and stole all the record company money, stole the tour money again after I gave him another opportunity. And then um, he was doing drugs and he called me up and the record company was like, you know, we're, we have you under contract. I had another band and we were getting ready to get signed to Roadrunner Records and Roadrunner said, you need a release from uh, Century Media. So then Century Media, when I called them up, they said, oh no, Harley signed you as an individual artist. We're not going to release you until you give us a tour of, finish off this album and give us a tour. We we. And he just bragged that he robbed them for $200,000 to somebody. And so I was on the hook for it. So I said, all right, I'm gonna give you this tour. I want it in writing. I'm gonna do a tour of the US, a tour of Europe. And, uh, and then um, um, I'm gonna finish these tracks and give you another record and then I want out. They said, fine. So as I'm touring, I'm getting, I go home from some shows. I start getting calls. I'm gonna rat you out for everything you ever done if you keep playing as the Cro-Mags. I'm like, that would be the biggest mistake you ever did in your life. And he did it in 95. He ratted me out and the cops and whatever came to my door, banged down the door. My brother was there. I was. I had a painting business at the time, so I was on a job site. I, I get this text message, I call back, Detect them the grown ninth precinct. I'm like, what? And I didn't know what happened. And and he's like, oh yeah, do you know a Harley Flanagan and a Paris Mitchell Mayhew? And I was like, and he called me by my name, John J. McGowan. Is this John J. McGowan? And I was like, that mother, you know. And um Did you then my brother called, text 911, 911. Call back. He's like, yo, they just came to that. I was like, I know, dude, they just text me. I told the cop, I go, look, I know you know I'm AWOL. I'm gonna turn myself in. I was in Spin Magazine, the whole story. Chris Garver from Miami Inc. put up the money for my lawyer. We lawyered up and I ended up beating the case because I never got in trouble at, at, when I left and they said I was a conscientious objector. They brought up what oh, I went Oh, there's through. a term for it. Yeah, that I, I became a Hare Krishna. So, I, you know, and I didn't want to, be involved in any kind of wars yeah. and my childhood. And the recruiter kind of fraudulently enlisted me. He didn't bring up any of my charges. Oh. So like mitigating circumstances, I ended up like the lies are told, I got a dishonorable discharge. No, I did not. 
I did not get a dis. I got a general discharge. They gave me all of my benefits and everything, which I did not take because I didn't serve the country like I was supposed to. But I was a messed up kid that should have never been allowed right. to go into the military in the first place. But while I was in, I tried to excel. When we're in those moments and we're like, why is this happening? It's all for a reason. Like when you come out of it, and it's, you're still gonna have those questions. Like I yeah. wonder why this is happening right now, even good or bad. Yeah, I don't question it anymore. Yeah. Because you know, someone said to me, I this so much press in the last years. Somebody goes, if you had the chance, would you change anything? I said, no, not one single thing I ever went through because it brought me to where I am today. I'm able to help people that went through stuff. I'm. I'm competing in Iron Man as a challenge to myself. I'm writing books, I'm writing film. I just got hired to write a TV show uh, about the Lower East Side in the 80s of like with uh, the guy that's doing the Mayans right now, Elgin James. Um, so like everything that I've been doing and everything I did in my past is the fruition of it just yeah. led me to this chair sitting here talking to you. <laughs> And these guys, these yeah. amazing guys <laughs> yes, behind they are the scenes. Amazing. Please tell us about your documentary you're making with Paul DeGelder and Kip Anderson called 30 to Life Changing the Paradigm of the Prison Parole System. Yeah, because I'm very much involved with this, uh, going to prisons and drug programs and whatever, and youth facilities to speak to people, and high schools with gangbangers in the city. And I've been to the one of the, the toughest high schools in New York City. And they all, it's the same thing. Oh, who's this white mother effer coming in here? This, that, Crips, Bloods, whatever. And then once I relate my story and I'm like, look where I've been and look where I could have been, they listen. So I said, man, imagine if we, and I said, I called up Paul and I go, listen, man, I got this idea. And then me and Paul, and I love Paul. Paul is yeah. a homie for life. Yes, I love I know. that dude. We is love the Paul. Baddest dude. <laughs> And I said, yo, here's my idea, man. Let's, 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 and this is what we could do. And me and him spitballed and we put together like a show Bible of the whole thing, everything. And then we gave it to Kip. Kip went to get funding and his investor right away was like, boom. He's like, we, he took it to him like Wednesday and he's like, this guy, Friday, we got the call. That's it. It's greenlit. So we went to this Amity Foundation out here. Mm -hmm. And it was like all these guys did over 20 years in some of the worst places. Chino, Pelican Bay, The Shoe, um, San Quentin. Like, I mean, this one older black gentleman was there. He was like pushing 80. He was there for the San Quentin famous riots. Mm -hmm. So these guys went there. I mean, what I did is child's play, like kitty camp compared to where these guys were and, and for how long. It just was always something about helping people to overcome stuff because that's what people did for me. So anytime I see those types of stories, I'm like, man, God bless him, man. And then, you know, when I got the chance to do this with Paul and Kip, I was like, let's do it. Yeah. You know, I think for the, the message I get out of that is people matter and how we treat each other, it matters. Yeah. It matters when we have, the, we're here to help each other and not hurt each other. Same with animals. I love animals and I love people, man. And, and uh, yes. both need help at this point. What made you go vegan? And do you feel you're more able to connect and empathize with animals that have horrific violence committed on them because of the violence you've endured? Absolutely. Uh, although, we never used the word vegan back in the day. We just yeah. said, like, I followed the, the Rasta diet, which they called ital. Ital is vital, lutal is fatal. <laughs> I love that. I heard you say that on yeah. a podcast. So, so, so the thing is, <laughs> when we went to Jamaica, my whole thing was to smuggle pounds back, right? So I got off the ship and the, I, I just looked for one of these Rasta dudes and this like 20 something year old dude with dreadlocks, like no shoes. I was like, yo, 
And he's like, what do you need, boy? Come talk to me now. I That's said, what? such a good impression. I said, I need some ganja to rest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he's like, I got you, man. We'll go up to the hills, man. Let's go. And then he was eating this stuff. I'm like, yo, what the hell is that? It was like green. Like, I know what it is now. Yeah. Kalalu, seaweed, yeah. beans, rice. He's like, man, this I tell you, eat this, you live to 120 taras, no disease taras. I was like, I said, let me try it. I was like, oh my God, dude, it tastes like dirt. <laughs> so like, we went up to the camp and um, the Naya Bingi drummers had their drum so circle cool. going. It was just mystical, like the whole thing. Couple of weeks later, I met the Bad Brains. Yeah. They were just starting to be Rastafarians. This guy, Ray Chinna, who knew, the, you know, from Jamaica, he knew everybody, the Rastas down there. I think he knew Bob Marley, the whole thing. And the singer from the Bad Brains was like telling me about Ital again. I was still taking quaaludes and crazy drinking and eating whatever the hell. And yeah. I got in a big fight with this gang, these gang members. And the Beastie Boys were there. Nobody would fight them at in the studio. So I just went toe to toe. The guy tried to stab me. I banged him out, knocked him out. He was the leader. And then his boys came at me with knives and I took off my chain. I started like getting in this chain fight. I ended who, up getting- Who was this person? These gang members that hung out. But the point I'm getting at is they put a KOS on me, which is kill on sight, and I couldn't go down there for months, and then I faced them. So as I go down to be like, all right, let's do this, they were like, take them to the building, and and and, and two of the members of the Bad Brains came out, and were like, yo, 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 yo. And they were able to squash it, and they were like, yo, out of anybody, you're the only one that got any balls down here, and they gave us respect, and then, Bad Brains let me move in the studio. And HR mentored me and took me under his wing. And uh, this was 81. And then the, uh, the, the guy who ran the studio, J.W. Lee, and produced the Bad Brains and Beastie Boys early records was, was a raw foodist. And he started taking me, they got me a job at the health food store. And then I got to meet Vittorius Kovinskis and Ann Wigmore and start getting into raw foods. And I worked in a health food store, so I had that. So you, you see how every little thing, it just kept like, here's another piece to the puzzle. But it was, and what HR told me was, we don't have a right to subject these animals to what you're doing to them. And then I saw the Frederick Weissman film, Meat. I don't know if you ever saw that. No. So hey, Frederick Weissman did documentaries. There's no, vo there's no voiceover narration, nothing. He just take, so he did this one about a mental institution called Titty Cut Follies. And then they showed me the Meat one. And he just, like, this was the, this was the kick, I was like, was there animal? Yeah, it starts oh, out, okay. it's, it, there's no dialogue. It starts out with a horse in a field in the winter and, the, and this horse is, the steam's coming out of its nose. Mm -hmm. And then it backs, pulls out the camera and there's a cowboy on the horse. Then it pulls out further, there's other cowboys on other horses, pulls out further, they're wrangling cows from the field to go into the trucks and they just took you through the process mm. of all of that and killing these animals and the fear. And Frederick Weissman wasn't even plant-based or vegan or whatever, vegetarian. He was just showing you what happens, not being didactic either way, like, oh, this is good or bad. He just showed you. And I was like, after I've seen, I saw people get murdered in front of me. I seen a dude's throat and, and and watch him expire in front of me and his throat cut and shot and violence my whole entire life. I was like, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm not going to support this. And the minute I said, and HR was like, you know, you could come on the road with us, but you can't eat no meat. You have to be ital, you gotta stop drinking and taking drugs and all this stuff. And I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. But I just was attracted to this peaceful nature. 
and and the smells of health food stores, like the, mm. the mom and pop stores yes. back in the day. Like yes, I, I, I still it. reminisce on that and I'm like, wow. Like the first job I got was before even New York. I worked at this place called Fields of Plenty and the manager was major. He was a friend of the Bad Brains, African-American cat, man, cool. Yeah. And the smells in the health food store of everything in the bins. And I'm like, wow, man. Mm. This just wakes up your senses and the organic produce. And I'm like, and then I use my body over the years as a, as a laboratory, man. I'm like, I'm going to do this to the utmost and see what I'm able to do. And I would go out on the road and I would be running 10 miles a day and working out with this martial arts cat and eating good. All these other bands trying to be rock and roll fantasy life would be getting mono and have to end their tours. I came off the road jacked, like yeah. healthier than when I left. And I'm like, now I'm 59 and doing Ironmans and everything else. So it speaks for itself, the diet and the lifestyle, the PMA, the positive mindset. It's, it, it all works together. How did your love for music start and how did you become a rock star despite being homeless at the time? Well, I'm not a rock star. You are a rock star. <laughs> All right, well, let me tell you something. And I wrote about it in my book. I always reference the evolution of a Cro-Magnon because no matter what we were going through, even the hell we were going through of my mother living in disgusting apartments running from my father, she would put 45s on in the kitchen of Motown and we would dance around and the music just took us to another place. I just watched a Billie Holiday movie. If you haven't seen it, United mm -hmm. States versus Billie Holiday. Oh my God. It's I good. was like, the similarities, like the music, no matter if she was raped as a child and just all this stuff and the music, unfortunately though, she got into the heroin a little much, but it was the music when we was kids. And then when we went into the foster home, I found this little AM radio and I talk about it in my book that I, I, I had a little earpiece and no matter what we were going through, I would go under the covers at night and listen to like, you know, Stevie Wonder and the Motown and all these songs and they would just take me away to another, I would just forget about what I was going through. And uh, yeah, so then, just been going, putting out records, Blood Clot, Both Worlds. Uh, I mean, I just we just got a record deal for Blood Clot like two years ago, and the singer relapsed and OD'd and died from dope. Oh, yeah, he got yeah, some yeah. of that fentanyl. Don't play. It's Russian roulette. You could think you're doing coke, and it's cut with fentanyl. Goodbye. So And you're completely clean, clean and sober Clean and now. sober, not even a sip of alcohol. Not Man, even life even. is a razor's edge. I know I'm an addict. I'm just choosing to not use today. Mm. And every day I wake up like that, I replace the negativity with the positivity. And that's where the Iron Man came in too, because it keeps me focused. It keeps me... I'm very goal-oriented. Like, I have to have a goal and work towards that. That's what I teach in my coaching business. You can't flow through life. I mean, you know, even in this book, I picked the minds of Navy SEALs, top athletes, men and women crushing it. And it's all mindset. It's all, you know, be the badass we're made to be on this planet. Yeah. None of us um, are here to live quiet lives of desperation and, like, you know, we're here to just be the best versions of ourselves that we can be yep. and stop listening to the enemy mind because yep. that's what got me in trouble so many times. Those voices in your head that are telling you to do stuff you shouldn't do. And that's where Iron Man comes in because it keeps me focused. What got you into becoming a triathlete, doing Ironmans and do you feel an organic whole food plant-based diet was an asset to your fitness journey? Right. So my late uncle Rocco D'Angelo, who I love. Uh, he was like the closest thing to a father that, that I ever had. When I would get in trouble, he would come try to get me out of trouble and was just the kindest. Mm. But he was from Italy, so he was really into cycling. Okay. And he took me cycling some, in the early 80s. But then one time we watched ABC Sports, Wide World of Sports. This was in the early, early 80s. 
and it was the Iron War, uh, Iron Man and Kona, uh, Dave Scott against Mark Allen, and then all the stories of the other people and everything they overcome, cancer and all crazy stuff. They lost their wife, like all of this. Uh, and they were just crying as they crossed the finish line. And I was like, I'm going to do that race one day. I'm going to do that race one day. Hmm. I told my uncle that. How old were you? Well, I was like 19. Okay, okay. But it never went away. And I always, over the years, biked, swam, uh, ran, played sports, whatever, b-ball in the courts of New York, this, mm -hmm. that, the other thing. Yeah. So then I started going to this bike shop, Sid's Bikes, and this dude, Larry, who's a rude boy, was like, yo, you got to meet this cat, Orion, man. He does Ironmans. He's like a 10-hour Ironman, African-American brother, boxed. Like, you guys are going to be... Dude, you guys are gonna hit it off, my dude Orion. Orion Mims, I love you, man. <laughs> and um, I saw him one time in Caravan of Dreams and he's with another dude. And I wanted to say something, but I didn't. And then I ended up in the bike shop with him at the same time one day. And Larry goes, yo, this is I. I go, I know who you are. Oh, cute. I said, I saw you in Caravan. That was you. He's like, yeah, man, you should have said something. I said, ah, he was with two other people, whatever. So I said, yo, I want to train and do a race. He goes, yeah, man, let's do it. Like, this guy's a stud. Like, you want to talk about a natural athlete, mm. six foot two, six foot three, boxers build, crushing Iron Man's nice. 10 hours. And then he goes, yo, um, we could get in the New York Iron Man, New York City Iron Man. It's, it's the inaugural one. We just raised a little money for the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. I said, bet. So he trained me. I got in Triathlete Magazine with him training me. And, nice. and he just took me under his wing. Like, we didn't have all the apps and the watches and the... But he just showed me what to do. And I was determined enough to do it. And then he did the race and I did, I mean, he crushed it. I did like 13 hours, but I played Philly the night before I did a show and I drove home, no sleep, broken bone in my foot and went to the swim start and got the race done in 95 degrees with a broken bone. With a broken bone and my my metatarsal cracked. What? And uh, and I cried like a baby when I crossed, excuse my French, That's cried funny. like a baby when I crossed the finish line. My girl told me she couldn't be there. And then oh, as no. I got my medal, she goes, John. And I look and it was her and I lit up oh. and, she took a, and she took that picture. <coughs> that was my first Iron Man. And then I just kept going. I got the bug. And uh, yeah, but the diet helps, man. You know, like it, it reduces inflammation. Uh, I put out a cookbook, Hardcore Kitchen. And I'll tell you a funny story because I, yes. ha I had it in the suitcase. And, uh, you know, they so you went into my suitcase box. at JFK and some of my stuff was gone and they took the cookbook. So who's ever... Cooking my recipes. You better call me for dinner, you sons of you know what. Cause you Enjoy stole, it. You, you know, I can't complain. You stole it, but you stole something that's going to help you. That's so right. uh, you We know. hope it helps you. And I was like, I called up Erica today. I was like, you saw me put that. I watched you put that cookbook, the two books, into the suitcase. And they took the cookbook. Everybody wants this knowledge. <laughs> Your cookbook is a hot commodity. So I'd like to end on one of my favorite things I've heard you say. Don't let events that have happened in your life determine who you are as a character. You can break free of any adversity. Don't let people's poison affect how we think about ourselves or take it personally. And wow. that is so true. I couldn't have said that better myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's you their know, unhealed resolve trauma. It, it, and we're not it, supposed it to is, take it man. On. And it's been a long path. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm turning 59. 
My brother's turning 60. He just you went don't have plant a wrinkle big. on your face. My, I got good genes, man. My mother, if you look at her, after all the hell she's been through, she's a, like just the most gorgeous person. Mm. And she's pushing 80. Wow. And she went plant-based now, too. Nice. And she beat heart disease and she nice. eats organic plant-based. Like yes. my brother eats organic plant-based. My older brother, E, you can't only be about working out right. and not diet. You right. can't only be about diet and right. no spirituality right. or all spiritual. And then you're eating McDonald's and right. doing whatever. It's like right. if you have those three, in con that's how I've been able to beat down these Demons, when, even when they rear their ugly heads, like years down the road, years, it's, you know, people say to me, oh, man, look where you're at now. I was like, bro, you ain't seen everything that happened. Mm -hmm. You didn't see what happened between seven years old and, 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 and 58, 59. Mm -hmm. you're like, you're seeing what the, you know, and I'm still trying to improve and get better, but there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears through that whole process, like, mm. and lessons and loss and just, but you, I said that today, you can't ever quit. You can't ever give up, man. You, yeah. you got to live by the warrior's code. And that's the last thing I said in the book, to never give up. Yeah, it takes well, more strength to be kind to somebody. That's courageous. Mm. To, when, when you have this pressure on you to be this tough, badass person and hurt people, to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to hurt animals. I'm not going to hurt people. Despite the pain that I have endured, I am going to stop the cycle right now with me. That takes so much more power, courage, and strength than it does to continue cycles. Well, you know what it was? I always had empathy and, and like for people that were suffering. Because of the suffering that I yes. had to go through. And I don't want people to have to go through that. Thanks so much for tuning in. Love, Gianna. And... John Juice. Jingle Heimerschmidt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end with some jokes. Woo!